Um, any thoughts or questions there? In that situation, are candidates able to take a break? What if a candidate needs a break, needs to leave the room for a minute or two? Yeah, we, talk, we talked about breaks a little bit um, because early on, uh, you know, we used to kind of do, it, it was like no break, you know? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, if people can get up and go to the bathroom, I consider that a break. Yeah. Um, they yeah. might not be, they, they still might be sequestered though, so they might not be able to leave the physical space. Like, they might not be able to leave the building, um, but people ideally can still at least get up and go to the bathroom. And so in, in those instances, it depends on what your software or how your software is handling that. If you have a live proctor, and the candidate just remotes, just raises their hand or sends a message in the chat or something like that. And they say, hey, you know, is it time for my scheduled break or can I take my scheduled break or, or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, if it's a recording, right, and you haven't set the recording up, then you'd be, you'd be watching a lot of people as they get up and go to the bathroom, right, if a break is allowed. So I think it just, it depends on which format you're utilizing and it depends on how uh, how you want to manage your breaks and, and how long you're, you're allowing people to break. Right. Um, I, I, I want to say that in uh, police testing, I feel like candidates were able to get a bathroom break, um, but they had like, there was like a bathroom monitor. Hmm. That was actually like sweeping the trash cans and making sure that, you know, escorting candidates like to the bathroom, right? Escorting them back to the center to make sure that they, uh, you know, I don't know, didn't, didn't, didn't connect up with another candidate or he wasn't talking to another candidate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a lower stakes version of that, you maybe are not terribly concerned with communication among different candidates. And then in a remote environment, all the candidates aren't sitting together. So you don't have necessarily right. have to be concerned about all the candidates talking to each other. But right. you still might be concerned about a candidate who has a cousin who's come over who's going to help them. Yes, right. Test, or um, you still or might be just a site. Yeah, who leaves the site for an inordinate amount of time. I mean, you'd be concerned about that. Yeah, yeah. Anybody who leaves the video view for you know, if you're going for like 20 minutes, it's like, what were you doing mm -hmm. um, in that amount of time? So, uh, so yeah, it's 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 a little. It can be it can be a little different depending on what your um, assessment does. So, a lot of folks will just select a remote proctoring vendor, and then they'll have a standard set of whatever they're doing, and um, some. You know, associations and certification programs will just kind of, will just kind of take whatever the set, the proctoring vendor will offer up. Mm -hmm. um, but remember that you know your proctor is your your vendor, whatever vendor it is, is working for you. So if you have guidelines that you want to change, or if there's something within their existing guidelines that you don't like, that you you know suggest that change, have them modify it. Um, you know, if you if you want your candidates to have a bathroom break and they don't, you know, tell them to build in some kind of a model where that your kids can get a bathroom break. Mm -hmm. If you want them to have um, any kind of break, sometimes not. Sometimes you just get a 15 minute break, just to break or to eat an apple or whatever. Um, you know, have if if that's what you want in your testing environments, or if that's how you want your candidates to test, then be sure to communicate that with your practicing vendor because they need to accommodate you. Um, post-exam processes. Um, so there are a ton of post-exam processes. Some of them are listed here on the screen, including uh, exam collection, scoring, Quality control, just like that AI, um, you know, video feed that we talked about. 
compilation of results, right? Result analysis. There's a lot of analysis that goes into the back end of your testing process. That data is often swept away into a much larger database or an item bank. And those statistics are or should be maintained in that item bank so that um, <clears throat> some kind of a psychometric person, some kind of a measurement person can review those statistics holistically to ensure that those questions are functioning the way that you intend them to function, um, to ensure that, um, uh, you know, if any questions do have problems, that the questions are um, reviewed by the item writing committee. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of work on the back end that goes into um, the results and analysis, particularly in item development of those items, once they are um, responded to by your candidate and then stored in your item bank. So um, be sure to store that data somewhere as candidates are responding to your assessment, particularly because, um, I mean, for all of those reasons, but like, for instance, if you want to apply for um, a process such as the ANAB process, you know, that we were talking about earlier on, you're going to need to have that data. You want to apply for an accredit. If you want to apply for accreditation, um, you'll need to have that data to demonstrate the, the validity and reliability of your exam. And you'll need to be able to demonstrate that you're reviewing that data and using that data on a regular basis. Uh, so score reports, so we talked about some folks are getting scored on site. Um, some folks do not score you on site. Some folks will, you know, take your exam as a part of a compensatory model and compile some other data along with that. And then you get a score later and you're like, this score is a part of it. Um, so scoring, um, can be a little different in that regard. If an exam is totally quantitative, then a computer can score it, right? Um, if there's a qualitative component or an essay component, then you might need to send that data back to a subject matter expert or a scoring committee or something like that, uh, or panel of assessors or whatever, in order to score and analyze those results and get them back to the candidate or whoever's presenting that data to the candidate. Um, some vendors will include that as a part of the exam. Like if you're buying an off-the-shelf exam, sometimes that scoring is included. The, the vendor will take the results, um, will administer the exam and then take the results and then send you back the scores so that you can present them to the candidate. Um, many of us on the Certification or association, association side of certification <clears throat> will have an internal scoring committee of subject matter experts or assessors that are scoring um, the candidates' uh, results and then will, you know, present that candidate with some kind of a pass or fail grade later on. So that they can get their cert. Um, and so that they can appeal if they, <laughs> if they don't like it. They don't like what you have given them. Um, <clears throat> so in uh, so there's a lot of conversation about AI <clears throat> right now. AI is impacting our field just like it's impacting every other field. Um, I think <clears throat> Some of the biggest concerns um, are like people being able to cheat on exams mm -hmm. with the use of artificial intelligence tools, right? And so, and previously we used to think of an SIA style exam as something that you couldn't you couldn't cheat on, right? Even if you can cheat, even if you got a hold of the answers to the multiple choice tests. You know, we knew that at least the essay you had to provide a genuine answer for. And that's um, now more so in question, particularly with the use of AI tools. Um, yeah, because they're going to use 
cat chat GPI, <laughs> right, to do their essays. GPT. GPT. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're going to use chat GPT to write their essays. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my thought is that even if a candidate is, so I think, I think that chat GPT is a shortcut, just like any other shortcut. You know, when Google first came out, we thought of Google as cheating, right? And we felt like people shouldn't be able to get a PhD if they have access to Google. Google is an amazing tool, right? And then I think now we're realizing like, well, it's just, it's just a shortcut to an end. But at the end of the day, you still have to have the knowledge, skills, and ability to review what that AI tool is generating. So I would think of the AI tool as like, um, what do you call like that legal assistant? Like um, you have different types of legal assistants. Like you have, you have some people that are just there to like shepherdize. You have some people there that just search, right? These tools allow us to have this army of assistants uh, the same way you know, a large research team would, we can, we can all have access to them. And I think that that's a great thing. You still have to, once that AI tool generates your essay, you still have to know that that stuff is correct. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So it's not that, um, you know, I don't think that the tool at all replaces, you know, human intelligence. You still have to review and then you still have to select what citations you want to include you still have to verify that the tool, you know, provided correct citations. You still have to verify that those are the, you know, the, the references that you want to use and that the reference material is credible material. So there's still a lot of intellectual work that you have to do in order to make sure that that tool is going to produce, um, you know, a finished work. I always say like, you know, ChatGPT or any AI tool can get you a great draft, but it's not going to be like the end all be all. It's, it's, it's not like it's going to produce a final report and then you don't, you don't have to do anything. So um, the decision making still lies with the human. I think that AI is just a tool. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see it being used as a tool in other parts of the process too, right? Like we talked about remote proctoring. Um, where, you know, rather than reviewing thousands and thousands of hours of video, your AI tool is um, going to flag certain behaviors and then suggest certain videos for you to review. So I think that these are great tools. Um, natural language processing has been allowed for a long time and you could uh, some of this technology has, is actually a little, is a little bit older than we think. I mean, it will come into the main stage, you know, because for whatever reason. But automated essay scoring, natural language processing, um, automated content generation. These things have been around for a while. Um, they kind of got repackaged and repurposed with the big, like, AI revolution. But... They're not as new as we we're kind of thinking they are. Um, questions, thoughts, comments. 